Welcome back. We're in Exodus chapter 20 now. This is the Ten Commandments chapter, and we're going to get just today the first two verses. And we've got a bunch of bits here we're going to throw in the bucket. So this might be longer than normal. Let's look at it. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So these two verses is kind of the preamble. It's called the preamble. It's not the Ten Commandments, but it is uh, the part just before it. And God speaks these words. So there's lots of bits here. We're just on the front edge of the Ten Commandments here now. So before we start all the way right into the Ten Commandments, let's let's look at a couple of interesting pieces here that, that just might be good to know. First of all, there's this is a these are actually the Devarim. These are the words, the ten words. We call them the Ten Commandments, but they're literally in the Hebrew language, they are the ten devarim, the ten words, words plural. Okay, so these are, and yet that doesn't mean they're not commandments, but I'm just saying that in the text, these are, these are definitely put out there as the words. Now, some people have said, well, there must have been five, per, five of the ten commandments or words per tablet. Well, if that's true, then the first five commandments take up 146 words in the Hebrew, and the last five commandments take 26 words in the Hebrew. So you'd have uh, one tablet that would be totally covered with words and you'd have the other tablet would have just a few on it. So I'm not sure it was broken up quite that way. Uh, but traditionally some have thought, well, five on one and five on the other. But there's also some we put four on one and, and six commandments on the other. So actually God didn't leave that for us. So we don't, we don't know that at this time exactly how that was broken up. Now here's another thing that's interesting. Out of the first four commandments, it says, the Lord, the Lord your God. That's the way it's referred to in the first four. So that's kind of interesting that the first commandments say the Lord your God and the latter part of the commandments just, just say you shall not do this. Now there's two kinds of law here. There's apodictic law and causistic law. You probably don't need to remember those, but apodictic law is like laying it out. Uh, this is the rule. These are categorical, universal, and imper moral imperatives, okay? And the Ten Commandments is basically this kind of law. Now, after the Ten Commandments, we're going to get into many, many chapters here of causistic law. Okay, these are if-then type statements. And, you know, they're very particular. They're quite specific. If this happens, then you do this. This is the specified punishment. But in the Ten Commandments here, we're not going to see that. The Ten Commandments are just laid out as imperatives. These are commands. It doesn't talk about what happens when you break it. When you break it, you're sinning, okay? Now, here's another thing to think about. Back in Exodus 19, we have the offer of covenant, and in Exodus 20, we have the offer of law. And notice the order that they came in. The, the law comes after the covenant. First you're in the covenant, then you get the law. And it can't be the other way around. That would be a works kind of salvation, but God puts, has them agree to the covenant before he gives them the law. I've got a note here from the Bible commentary. I forgot which one it was. I think it's Stuart. The purpose of covenant is to institute unique relationship between two parties. The purpose of laws to provide boundaries to that relationship that if honored will go a long way in perpetuating that relationship. What banks are to a river, law is to covenant. To take away the banks and the river quickly becomes a swamp. So you have covenant and you have law and they kind of are their own thing. And first God puts them in the covenant in Exodus 19. They agreed to it. I want to bump over to Psalm 19 just for a minute here. We don't usually do this. We kind of uh, try really hard to keep in that right in the text. Because otherwise we could be all over the place. But I want to look at, I want to look at Psalm 19 with you and notice... Uh, how the psalmist views the commandments, because uh, it's, it's helpful. So if you're at Psalm 19, verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. And who does the psalmist attach the law to? Uh, does he attach it to Sinai? Well, it's interesting. When you read the first verses in Psalm 19, he connects the law to creation. Isn't that interesting? Uh, verse 1, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and the expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and so on. The stars, the sun, they all testify to God's, uh, God's existence. And so the psalmist in number 19, Psalm 19, connects God's law as you read through the whole psalm. He doesn't connect it really with Sinai. He connects it with creation. And that's interesting because... Uh, we believe that these things all kind of existed back there in creation. And so uh, it's not just, if we weren't going to just say the law is Mount Sinai, it's a bad thing, uh, it's a legalistic thing. Well, the psalmist didn't see it that way. 
Finally, I want to go right back to the text because we really didn't talk about the text yet. We're looking at these first two verses. So the Lord said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So God is linking his deliverance of his people. He's linking his law with delivering them from bondage. Now, a lot of people today, they want to say God's law. Well, we're not worried about the law. That could be a legalistic thing. Be careful. You're not too much into obedience uh, because it's we don't want you to be in bondage to legalism, they call it. Well, God here uh, didn't follow their plan at verse 2, did he? God said, look, I delivered you from bondage, and now I'm going to give you the law. So God's not against his law. He's going to lay it out. Ten universal imperatives, moral words for them. And God is definitely not against his own law. So first God delivers you, then you obey. God gives you grace. He gives you salvation, and you love him, and you seek to cooperate with him and do what he says to do. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. All right. Uh, we'll stop there and come back tomorrow morning and carry on into commandment number one.